absolutely beautiful day out, but we do need to ship something out and run an errand. So we're gonna take care of that and uh, probably try to set you guys up for a little cold start if we can, because you know, those always sound awesome. What is going on you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to this vlog. We're gonna be getting into some topics later on about, you know, how much power can the different year Mustangs handle? This kind of came up because I was talking to my buddy who's a big fan of Evos. He has a Mitsubishi Evo. He actually started out with the Lancer and then, I don't know, we just kind of got talking and he's actually a buddy from high school. And he wanted to know a lot about Mustangs. Like, are there any downsides to these Mustangs? They seem like they can just hold a whole bunch of power and go super fast. So we'll talk about what these capabilities really are in stock form and then what you'll need to upgrade. So I kind of want to get into that for you guys. Plus, this is one of the first videos I think of driving after we did the BG fluids, which those fluids, it's like a hundred bucks, 120 bucks or something. My transmission's completely cold, right into first, second, third, fourth. It just feels so much better. Like right now what I'll do is on this turn, a big one for me was always the second. I'd be like, right now I'm in first. And then right about here, I'd go into second and it would be notchy, but right there it was not notchy. Like it, it kind of like hit a, a soft wall that if you, if you could outforce it, you could totally get into the gear. But yeah, I mean, this is way better cold and it only gets better and better. Like I drove it yesterday to go grab some food. It only gets better and better the more that you drive it and the more that it warms up. So, I mean, like downshift, I mean, this thing is, it just, oh man, it feels so much better. Jeez, people, why did you park so far away from the grocery store? Like this is a totally different part of the shopping mall and you're rolling your car over here. So uh, does anyone else like really like watching their car in the, the mirror or not the mirror, but the reflection of the building like that? Like, oh, I love looking at it. It looks so mean with the blacked out headlights. I just got a quote for shipping something that is going to out of the country and literally just got a quote that it's gonna be $1,800 to ship it. But it is a pretty sizable thing, but it's not like massive, crazy. But hey, I mean, uh, we'll see if we can work around that because I really don't want to pay that to ship this one product over there. Oh well, put on my sunglasses there because I was getting a crazy freaking glare. But yeah, one of you guys actually on Facebook on Anything Coyote was asking, how do you get rid of the dash glare? This is totally like off topic of the video, but I want to throw it in there as a quick tip. But how do you get rid of this dash glare? Because on a Mustang, it totally reflects this dash up, especially if you're someone that uses some greasy armor all, armor all type stuff. The best way to fix that is drive with polarized sunglasses. I literally cannot drive without them now. I've become so accustomed to having less re reflections and glare and all that, that I literally have to drive with them. So that's why I wear my polarized Oakleys. Not saying that's the only brand out there. Polarized glasses are pretty cheap nowadays, but just pick a style and roll with those because it'll make it so much easier. You'll notice like looking at traffic lights and trying to read signs, so much less glare. All right, let's see. Oh my God, it just popped in the first, like no big deal. Let's hop on the freeway here. Let's see who we're dealing with. And slapped on the brakes. Yeah, well, I definitely uh, merged onto the freeway. I wasn't gonna be the guy that held up traffic. Let's go ahead and hit the hot spot. Oh man, there's a three valve. Is this a sign? I really wanna pick out a three valve, pick up a three valve as a build. I mean, that's a GTCS, so that's a really nice one. I kind of want one that's beat up and we can kind of customize and make our own and really uh, add some value to her and turn her into something great. Three valve, because it goes so well with S197 and just being one of the favorites. I just think that would be a great addition to the channel. Let's go ahead and get everybody set up here and not fall off this ramp because that would absolutely suck. Ended up having to actually move and I almost ran right into this pack of, oh nice, that just landed right on the hood. 
but I found a nice little shaded spot which I guess is a little bit better because I won't be sweating my face off because of all the sun and everything like that but again I didn't air it out but we found a nice shady spot even has a nice park bench so maybe this is going to be a new spot where we talk about stuff at the other spot there was a semi truck that was idling and i don't think you guys would have enjoyed just listening to a semi truck in the background so we came here the topic of today's video is going to be how much power can these mustangs actually handle and what are their capabilities and what are their downsides because i've i've talked it up a lot where the mustang is one of the greatest muscle cars ever. I love the 1314. However, we do need to understand there are some limitations to it. So I'm gonna cover those today. First limitation across all Mustang GTs is going to be the transmission on the manual side. Everyone knows this, so I'm starting with this, which is the MT82. The MT82 is a Getrag Chinese made transmission, not the best internals. There are some things you can do to it to help beef it up or to soften the wear and tear on it. However, just know this isn't one of the strongest parts of the Mustang, and that's something you gotta know when you're hopping into it. Alrighty, you're pretty much good to go for like 800 horsepower above, um, and then after that, you gotta start building it, which is clutches, uh, converter, things like that. But right now with the MT82, people break these on stock NA cars with maybe just a, you know, a tune and an intake. You can still bang gears enough to break the MT82. Now let's get to the next limitation. This is the big boy that a lot of people are asking, which is how much power can these things hold? And let's talk about it on two different sides. There's power stock, untouched, seal, they call it sealed motor. And that's that. So that's how much it is to just slap on a power adder, like a supercharger or a turbocharger which we'll also get into later on. And then there's also small amounts of build parts, you know, this, a couple of things, and then there's fully building a motor. So let's get into that first. Uh, this is going to split them up into Gen 1 Coyotes, Gen 2 Coyotes, and Gen 3 Coyotes. So if you guys aren't aware, Gen 1s happen from 11 to 14. We'll keep it simple there and just say Gen 1s, 11 to 14. There's a few things that I could elaborate on in the 14s, but let's just say 11 to 14, Gen 1, we got that. 15 to 17, S550, Gen 2. 18 to 20, or 21, I guess, Gen 3 Coyotes. So there's three generations of Coyotes. Starting with Gen 1, which is the most popular, the most of those are probably around right now, and you guys that are watching this are most likely a Gen 1. Gen 1s are stock rated at about 400, 420 horsepower at the crank. Now, that means that from a stock power perspective, you're getting some pretty decent high 370s probably to the wheel, and that's great. So a lot of people are happy with that, and that's plenty for on the freeway and to get up and get around town. That is totally fine if you're happy with that. that that's no big deal. We're talking about adding power though. When you start throwing on a supercharger, turbos, nitrous, things like that, you do add a lot more wear and tear onto the car because it's just added stress, more air, more fuel, more pounds of everything. Just Boom, bigger boom, you know, that's how power happens. So when you add on a power adder, for example, let's just start with something like a turbo or supercharger. Really conservatively, if you want this thing to be a long lasting Gen 1 Coyote unopened, what you're looking for is about 650 wheel horsepower. Now I'm being very conservative there. It may be some people have had experiences of 900, 800 on their stock Gen 1s and it's lasted for a long time. We're not talking about the anomalies. We're gonna go with the safety net and just give you guys good advice as far as this goes. So 650 wheel, regardless of your power adder, is the best bet. There are, however, better and worse power adders that can give you uh, more stress on the motors. For example, Pro Chargers with the way that their support system and stuff works, it can definitely add more stress to the crank. Turbochargers are one of the least, I guess, least harmful to your motor because the low end torque isn't there and all that. So the things that hurt your motor are gonna be uh, excess pressure on crank and pulleys. And then also it's gonna be how much low end torque. The more low end torque, the stock rods, which are the weak point are going to go. So when you're stock everything and you're just supercharging, stick to about 650 wheel horsepower and you can still have fun with it and not be like, pooping yourself every time you start the car up, like is today gonna be the day it blows? Don't get me wrong, it's not a guarantee that it won't blow. Motors and their machines, things happen, so I can't guarantee anything there. But 650 is a pretty safe bet. And I'm not talking about Roadrunners, which are technically the boss motor, we're gonna stick to the Coyote. So now let's go into the Gen 2 Coyote. When you get to the Gen 2 Coyotes, 15 to 17, you're pretty much good to about 900 wheel horsepower unopened. So almost, well, 250 horsepower wheel horsepower over the Gen 1s just by having a Gen 2. 
And there's lots of people that can attest to that with Whipples, turbos, even pro chargers. There's people out there pushing them that hard. Now, what's the difference? On the Gen 2 Coyotes, they came with powder forged, I believe it's called, for the rods. And the rods are the weakest part of the Coyotes until you start getting into the cylinder walls. But right now, the rods are the weakest point. Gen 3 Coyotes. I would honestly stick to the same thing of the Gen 2s and say 900 horsepower is safe. People get away with 1,000 and 1,200. But I'm trying to give you guys a decent little uh, idea of what's safe around here. And the Gen 3, Gen 2s, I think 900 wheel horsepower is a lot of car. Like I couldn't even imagine double my wheel horsepower. That's a lot of car. So a lot of these people chasing that 1,000 wheel horsepower, you might be risking it, but 900 to 1,000, it's a lot of car to handle. I mean, there's a lot of YouTubers out there that have that amount of power. And you can see they're struggling to put it down and it's, it's kind of just spin city on the street, which is fun at first, but when you actually want to go fast, spinning ain't winning and that's, that's the truth. So let's say you want to go above those limits that I kind of set there and you have your certain year, right? You want to know what can I do to make it go above that safely? Well, the biggest thing, even on those stock Gen 2 powder forged rods, are the rods. The Coyote rods are one of the weakest parts. So if you got rods and pistons, basically you're good for any generation Coyote, safely a thousand horsepower. Now, you can definitely you can definitely make it safer. You can definitely do some things as extra insurance, such as sleeving and even Coyote sleeve supports. Honestly, if I were to build a motor, I don't know if I would do a sleeve. I think I would do the sleeve supports because people have been running eight seconds with 1200 horsepower consistently with sleeve supports and data kind of proves that it, it can help. And it's really this block, which I'll have a photo probably right here, a couple of photos. It's these blocks that go in between the sleeve supports and the water jacket, which has a gap. And that's one of the places that it cracks and blows out. So I'll have some visuals up there to help you guys. But this, this whole problem is only a big issue once you start really pushing a lot of boost and a lot of PSI with torque but really the rods and pistons are one of the biggest things. So if you can build rods, pistons, and sleeve support, I think you can easily handle a thousand horsepower and thousand torque consistently. And those sleeve supports are a couple hundred, like 400 bucks. If you have the skills, you can do it yourself versus sleeves are a lot more expensive because it, re it requires a lot more machining. With the sleeve supports, I think you drill a couple holes and it mounts in there with a grub screw or a, a set screw but rods and pistons, if you can do that yourself and assemble it with ARP stuff. I didn't really mention it, but this is all going without saying that you're upgrading to ARP. Don't use factory hardware above factory specs. Use ARP good quality racing hardware and it's gonna take you a long way. Now, if you wanna go fully, go crazy, 1500 wheel horsepower, definitely do rods, pistons, forged crank, like a boss crank, and then also do sleeves, like Darton sleeves. That right there is a 1500 horsepower capable car. Let's say you're just a crazy guy. You wanna go balls to the wall, 1500 horsepower, just off to the deep end right away. You're talking 13, 15 grand into your motor just for safe, safety, peace of mind, and you wanna just crank the boost up. Sleeves, rods, pistons, ARP hardware, ported heads. That motor is 1500 horsepower capable all day long, safely with a lot of pounds of boost with a turbo, supercharger, whatever. Um, yeah, that's that's one of the things there. And if you have a Pro Charger, or I think a Vortex Supercharger or a Whipple, MFP Australia makes these brackets that I've been keeping an eye on that basically limit the pressure on your crank. So if you do that, there's a lot of safety nets. I'll have a link down below to a lot of different things here. What really got me interested in looking into these limits and why I know about them is through Andrew at Mustang Lifestyle. He's been working with Modular Head Shop who built his 5.8 that's in his GT500. Totally different ball game than a Coyote, but similar mod motor with big heads, dual cams, stuff like that. But you do need to sleeve it and all that with what he did. So he went crazy balls to the wall. That dude's wild and has a lot of horsepower and probably a decent amount of headroom on that motor. But modular head shop, I'll leave a link down below for you guys to check it out if you wanna order some engine parts. I haven't ordered anything from them, but through Mustang Lifestyle and checking it out and watching the owner Jordan talk about motors, he's so knowledgeable, knows everything and wants to do everything right, which I enjoy. It's hard to find people that take that kind of pride in their work these days. And Jordan is one of those guys that takes a lot of pride in his work. So I'm gonna shout him out. He had all these different packages for the rotating assemblies and he'll even do balancing. So they're like perfectly in balance with a lot less, uh, I guess just wear or 
resistance on the actual rotation, which it basically frees up horsepower. And yeah, he, he sells these packages with different horsepower ratings and even does short blocks and things like that. So I'm gonna leave a comment or leave a description link down below for you guys. I wanna thank you guys so much for tuning in. Now, for the real OGs, I wanna see who all stayed to the end of the video and listened all the way through. Leave a comment down below of what is your ideal power for your car. So I'm assuming you have a Mustang. And then tell me what generation Mustang you have. Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, or I guess what generation Coyote. And then tell me what are your power goals and why. So if you want a thousand horsepower, why is it that you want a thousand horsepower? Do you want to have that dyno sheet for the ego or do you actually want a thousand horsepower worth of power to go fast down the track? You know, some people are really happy with 500 wheel. Why do you want that? I just want to know why you guys choose the amount of power that you want. For me, I think I'd be pretty happy with 650 for the beginning. Just have a little bit more than stock probably whoop up on most Hellcats and most cars on the street and then obviously still have that beautiful supercharger under the hood. We'll see though in the future. I just want to hear from you guys though and understand where you guys are coming from and why you're picking the power that you guys really want. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, then please comment, like, and subscribe and I'll catch you guys next time.